I've always found Palm Sunday to be a bit odd. Now, at a church I served in LA, there was one Palm Sunday where the praise team leader and I had a mix-up. I thought I had told him after my sermon, I want to go straight into a rich, deep worship song. So as I'm finishing up my sermon, the praise team sets up. They get ready. And I finish my sermon by saying in an impassioned way, let's really worship Christ our King. And right then our praise team starts to play Celebrate by Cool and the Gang. <laughs> Celebrate good times. Come on, right? You know, I mean, I'm a fan of Cool and the Gang. But there was a total disconnect between the sermon and the worship that followed. Now, I kind of sense this same disconnect between Palm Sunday and the events of Holy Week that follow. On Palm Sunday, there's this pomp and circumstance, right? And we, we, we join in the crowds and waving palm branches and, and shouting, Hosanna! But five days later, these same folks are yelling, crucify him. Do we really want to follow their example? It just, it just strikes me as a little odd. But Palm Sunday is a very significant day. And it is certainly worthy of remembering and celebrating. For it is the start of Holy Week. And Holy Week is the most important, most influential week in human history. And there is a lot of rich meaning and irony going on within Palm Sunday. So what I want to do today is, is pretty simple. It's two things. First, I want to help us understand what took place on Palm Sunday. And second, I want to unpack what that means for us today. So first... Let's take some time to understand the events that took place on Palm Sunday. And, and the reason we need to do this is because we're 2,000 years and, and thousands of miles removed from these events and from the culture and the tradition in which they took place. If we saw someone riding down the middle of the poly on a donkey, we would look at that person and say, oh, poor guy, right? <laughs> Someone at least get him a car or a bike, something, right? He's riding a donkey. Now, if the Jewish people at the time of Jesus saw this, they would think something completely different. Now, on Thursday, I had the privilege of participating in a, in a special event that took place right here, right over there, right on our lanai. Our uh, Tongan congregation, which we're worshiping together with today, is part of the Constitutional Free Church of Tonga. And their president, the leader of the, the Constitutional Free Church of Tonga, flew in from Tonga and came here. And so they had a special lunch for him. And I got to tell you, it was an amazing lunch. I put a picture up on Facebook. It's one of those lunches where I'm like, wow. So before the lunch, though, group of pastors were sitting right over here. The president was on a chair. Pastors were all over there. I was invited to join them. Things were being said in Tongan. My, I'm a little, my Tongan's a little rusty. Um, so I, I was missing most of what was being said. But then there was, a, there was a little ceremony, if I could call it that, where they made a, a presentation to the president. And as part of this ceremony, two pastors spoke. They were speaking in Tongan. And as they spoke, others kept saying, Malo, Malo. And, and I kept hearing this, so finally I turned to the pastor sitting next to me and I said, does Malo mean amen? And he said, no, Malo means thank you, right? Malo, mahalo, make the connection. And then Albert explained to me later that when someone is speaking to a chief in this type of setting, in this way, uh, others say Malo. That's how they respond verbally. And so as I got a chance to experience this, this, this cross-cultural experience, which was really neat for me, I realized, you know, ah, this is how you greet a chief. This is how you greet a leader in Tongan culture. And I got a, a window into that. Now, in the same way, when we look at what goes on on Palm Sunday, we get a window into how a leader, into how a king would have been greeted 
in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day. Now on Palm Sunday, we remember Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus begins this journey to Jerusalem in Jericho. Now Jericho is 16 miles from Jerusalem. And I actually have a, a picture that I want to show you. Um, starting in Jericho, and you can see the ascent of Adamim is the kind of the way the road, the travel that you would take is, and the Wadi Quilt is the area that runs up to Jerusalem. Jericho is one of the lowest points on the face of the earth. Jerusalem is on a hill. To go from Jericho to Jerusalem is a 3,400 feet climb in elevation. Now, I got knocked out just trying to go up to Cocoa Head Crater, and I think that's about 1,000 feet. So this is a 3,400 feet elevation climb that Jesus would have done on Palm Sunday. He would have started about 6 a.m. at daybreak. It takes about seven hours to go from Jerusalem, excuse me, from Jericho to Jerusalem. And as you make your way to Jerusalem from Jericho, the last hill you hit is called the Mount of Olives. And from the Mount of Olives, you get a clear view of the city of Jerusalem and of the temple sitting on top of it. Now that temple was destroyed, so we don't have pictures, we don't have photos of it. But here's a rendition of what the temple looked like. Here's what Jesus would have seen. This temple was an amazing structure. Absolutely amazing. Now at the Mount of Olives, Jesus gets on a donkey and he rides the donkey into Jerusalem and up to the temple. Now Jesus has prepared for this. He had sent his disciples ahead of him and said, please have a donkey ready for me in the Mount of Olives. Why? Why does Jesus ride into Jerusalem on a donkey when he's already walked the 16 miles of the journey? Well, he does this as a sign. A sign to show everyone that he is the king. That he is the long-awaited Messiah, the king of Israel. Listen to these words from the prophet Zechariah, which were spoken 550 years before Jesus. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a coal, the foal of a donkey. Jesus' choice of a donkey is very intentional. He is declaring for all to see, yes, I am the messianic king that you have been waiting for. And as Jesus rides this donkey into Jerusalem, people start lining the road, waving palm branches and yelling, Hosanna! Why? Well, to get at what's going on here, we need to understand two important Jewish holidays or festivals. The first of these is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. In Leviticus, God commands his people to celebrate this festival every fall. And to do so by coming to Jerusalem and building these makeshift booths or huts as a way of remembering that there were once wanderers in the wilderness. And as part of this, pe this festival, the people recite the Psalms of Ascent, which are Psalms 113 through 118. In Psalm 118, we find these words. Save us, O God. Deliver us, O God. Which in Hebrew is the word Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. And on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, that last day is called the Great Hosanna. On that day, the people recite Psalm 118 and they cry out together, Hosanna. And they also take three kinds of branches, one of which is a palm branch. They bind them together and they wave them in the air. And they wave these branches as they march around the temple or synagogue seven times. Now the interesting thing is that they still do this today. They still wave these branches. Here's a, here's a picture from Jerusalem, a recent picture. Now the palm branches that they use are still closed. We tend to use the open palm branches, right? They use closed palm branches so they look like a spike. But this still goes on today 
as part of the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the first feast or holiday that helps us understand what's going on on Palm Sunday. The second one is Hanukkah. Now, some of us might know the Adam Sandler song, but that might be our, our knowledge of Hanukkah. But here's the background to this holiday. So 165 years before Jesus, there was a Syrian king who conquered the Holy Land. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. And he wanted, basically wanted the Jewish people to assimilate to the culture around them. He wanted to lose that which was distinct about their culture. And as you can imagine, they didn't like this. So they rebelled against Antiochus. Now he responded by sending troops into Jerusalem, conquering Jerusalem and taking over the temple. And then he went a step further. He went into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place on earth, for the Jews, and he sacrificed a pig to the god Zeus. Now, for the Jewish people, that's the ultimate act of humiliation. Basically, the worst thing you could do. And so they revolted. They rose up against the Syrians, and they defeated them. They cast them out, and they cleansed the temple. This is the event that is celebrated at Hanukkah. Now, the family that began this revolt is called the Maccabees. And when the oldest son in this family, Judas Maccabee, returned to Jerusalem from a military victory, the people lined the road, they grabbed palm branches, and they yelled, Hosanna to the son of David. That happened just 160 years before this event. See, they welcomed Judas Maccabee as their king, as their Messiah, as the one who would rescue them. So with just this little bit of cultural background, we can see how politically and religiously charged the events of Palm Sunday are. As Adam Hamilton points out, when the crowd welcomes Jesus in the way they do, with palm branches and yelling Hosanna, they are saying, do what Judas Maccabee did. Defeat our enemy, now the Romans. Cast out our, our, our oppressors. Restore the glory of Israel. Jesus, save us. Do it now. Do it again. And in doing this, they are basically saying, be the Robocop Messiah that we expect you to be, that we want you to be. You know, there were dozens and dozens of would-be messiahs prior to Jesus. And all of them promised to be the robocop Messiah. All of them promised to stand up and fight the Romans. But Jesus is a different kind of king. And Jesus has a different kind of path to freedom. And because Jesus doesn't meet the people's expectation, because he doesn't give them what they want, by Friday they turn their back on him. See, and here's where I think we get to the meaning of Palm Sunday for our lives today. Are we all that different from the crowds that welcomed Jesus? Isn't one of our biggest struggles that we want Jesus on our terms? We have certain things we expect from Jesus. We have certain things we want from Jesus. We know what we need. We want Jesus to help us get it. But that's not how things work according to Palm Sunday. You know, in Luke's gospel, as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, as he takes in the view of the city, he stops and he weeps. There's only two places in all the gospels where Jesus cries after his friend Lazarus dies, and as he looks and he sees the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Luke writes this, As Jesus came near and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. Saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. In the, de 
Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. See, Jesus knows what's going to happen to Jerusalem. He knows that the people are going to choose the Robocop Messiah path, that they're going to fight the Romans, and that as a result, the city of Jerusalem will be completely destroyed, leveled to the ground, the temple completely leveled, all of which happened 40 years after Jesus' death. As Adam Hamilton points out, according to Jesus, there are two paths we can take. One is Jesus' narrow and difficult path. It's the path of God's kingdom. It's the path of peace that eventually leads to life, according to Jesus. The other is a wide and easy path. It's the path that makes sense to us. The, the path that naturally appeals to us. The path that says, protect yourself, and pay back others. But it's a path, according to Jesus, that leads to destruction. Jesus calls us to follow his path, the path he takes during Holy Week, the path of sacrificial love, the path of laying down your life, the path of loving your enemies, the path of taking up your cross and following him. There are two paths in life. Which path are you on? Jesus' path is narrow and hard. It will never be a big hit with the crowds. But it is the path that leads to life. In 1732, two men in Copenhagen boarded a ship to go to the West Indies. These two men were John Leonard Dober, a potter, and David Nishman, a carpenter. These two men were Moravian missionaries, and the reason they were heading to the West Indies was to sell themselves into slavery so that they could preach Christ's gospel of love to the slaves. Can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine willingly choosing to become a slave in order to share the love of Christ with slaves? Can you imagine stepping onto a ship knowing that you are laying down your life the moment you reach your destination? Jesus can, because that is in essence what Jesus did on Palm Sunday. These two men chose Jesus' path, the narrow path, believing that it ultimately leads to life. Now I recognize that the vast majority of us will never be missionaries to the West Indies. But each of us makes daily choices. And in our daily choices, we are choosing one of two paths. In our daily choices, we are either going with Jesus down his path or we are wandering away from his path. I have a friend named Doug. And uh, Doug lives in L.A. And one day he was at church. His sons were, he had two young sons at the time. And they were in the church patio with a babysitter. After church, a van pulls up, a guy jumps out of the van, steals the babysitter's purse, jumps back in the van and takes off. Like in the church patio after worship. Now, Doug hears about this. He runs outside, of course, like, are my kids okay? I mean, what's your natural reaction there? Like, this guy could have seriously hurt my kids. He stole a purse from the church patio? Natural reaction would be what? Fear? Anger? So Doug checks in with his kids, kind of makes sure they're okay. And as he's doing that, he really senses Jesus saying, like, this is an opportunity to choose my path. This is an opportunity to model my path for your kids. To love your enemies, to seek forgiveness. It may not feel like it, but that's actually the only path that leads to peace. So Doug gets together his sons and he says, hey, let's pray for the mean man that stole that purse. And let's forgive him. So they get together on the church patio and they pray together and they, they pray and they forgive the man who stole the purse. 
And then at the end of the prayer, Doug adds, and God, change this man's heart, have him return the purse. Just kind of throws in that, that prayer at the end. Next day, Doug gets a phone call from the babysitter. She said, you're not going to believe what happened to me. 20 minutes after they pray, the babysitter gets a phone call. It's from the guy who stole her purse. He calls her and says, I just feel terrible about stealing your purse. I am so sorry. He calls her and then he returns the purse to her. That's kind of crazy. There is a path that leads to peace. And it's not the path that we would naturally take. And the reality is that God can use all of us as we walk down that path. All we have to do is follow Jesus. All we have to do is say yes to the path. As Martha Grace Reese writes, God may call you to do a mission trip or to make an apology or to plant a hundred trees or to see Jesus in the face of a boy with Down syndrome. God may be calling you to try a new way of relating to your spouse, to help build an orphanage for AIDS orphans, to send someone a note, to have tea with a friend. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to know what we're doing. All we have to do is be available and obedient. All we have to do is say yes to Jesus' path. There are two paths in life. Which path are you on? It's pretty easy to wander away from Jesus' path. Holy Week is a time to reflect on the direction of our life and a time to come back to Jesus and his path. For it is a difficult path, but it is the path that leads to life. Amen.